Well, um, I am Dave. I serve as the lead pastor of this church. My wife, Alyssa, is our kids' pastor. And yesterday, we celebrated 11 years of marriage. Can you believe it? She's, yeah, clap for her, pray for her. I don't know how, I don't know how, I don't know why she stuck with me this long, but the paperwork is too extravagant to change at this point, probably, so she's sticking it out with me. Um, Man, I'm so excited for what God's doing through this collection of messages we're calling Discover the Spirit. And a few weeks ago, you remember that I was holding a sword, and it was kind of awkward, but what we were talking about, because this sword was a real sword, I mean, this was a legit sword, but we were highlighting the fact that the Spirit of God is an offensive weapon in your hand as the Word of God. We read in scripture that the sword of the spirit is the word of God in your life. And so you saw me holding a sword so that you'd always remember that and also maybe have a little bit of hope that a sword is never like used on you, but you can use it on the devil. That's, what's, that's what you want to do. And then you saw me hold a tennis racket because the Holy Spirit came, Jesus said, as an advantage in our life. And so just as at Wimbledon or any of these other like big tennis matches, it, you know, when somebody's up by one point and they're tied and the next point wins, you say, advantage! And then fill in your own name. Some of you are like, I'm awake now. I'm awake now. Uh, Advantage! Because then you fill in your last name or your name to remind us that just as in tennis, if you're up by one and the next point wins, you're set up for victory in a situation in your life in the spirit. You can also be set up to win on the tennis court and you can impress your friends to understand the scoring in tennis, which is not very clear. So that was just a side bonus of a couple weeks ago. Then last week, were any of you here for Pastor Ryan's incredible message on the fruit of the Spirit? That was amazing. I listened to it, and I loved about what Pastor Ryan said. And he didn't say it like this, but sometimes, you know, we kind of make up what pastors say, because then we can understand a little bit better. I don't know if he said it exactly like this, but this was the message I got. I spend too much time in my life choosing joy, choosing peace, seeking the, you know, Whatever, self, I wish I'm, I'm going to be more self, I'm going to have more self control today. And we seek the fruit of the Spirit rather than root our lives in the Spirit of God. Because an apple tree isn't like, uh, and then a little apple pops out. Like they're not trying to produce an apple. They're an apple tree. Some of you are like, was he, what was he doing? An apple tree just produces apples because that is what the apple tree does. So if we're rooted in the Spirit, that's the fruit, that's the fruit. The, what's produced out of our life. And today, I want to talk to you a little bit about that the Spirit of God brings us power. So this is the title of the message, You Have the Power. And if you're over age 30, you're thinking about jock jams right now, and I want you to stop, knock it off. I got the power. Don't think that way. And if you're less than 30, you have no idea what I'm talking about because you've also never heard of a Walkman. And that's okay, too. I don't judge you, but check your heart because you've got to stop judging me for being old, too. Uh, but I, I want to tell you, when it comes to power in the Spirit, you don't always get what you expect. And I was reminded of this, and I feel like this side of the room needs to hear this more than everybody else. So I'm going to walk over here, and I'm going to play with Cody's pedals. Sorry, no, I will not play with your pedals, Cody. But this is what happened to me yesterday. We were on this date, Alyssa and I were, for dinner, and the light of Jesus shone on us. <laughs> and where was I? We were at dinner, and Alyssa and I, we decided to check out a new restaurant. And let me tell you, that is a risk. How many of you know that's a risk to try out a new restaurant? You've been spending the same inflated dollars or whatever, buying the same food. You don't want to take a risk. You know you like, at Grand Junction, the chicken cordon bleu. Like, you know you love that. So don't deviate from what you know, right? But, but we tried out a new restaurant, and we were surprised. We were the only couple in this restaurant, a relatively new restaurant, and we were the only couple, and there were like five people on the clock, and they were all waiting on us, which is a little bit awkward, which is like either a royalty or it's a slow day, right? So they're like, everyone's like helping us out, and, and Alyssa and I are like super like dressed up, or not super dressed up. She was really dressed up. I was just like, you know, you know for guys, you like do your best and like hope for the best. So I was as cleaned up as I could, could be, and we're sitting there all alone in this restaurant, and we're like, why is it so dead in here? Like, are they... Are they like about to close? And what we found out is that they're actually doing very well, so you'll be, good, you'll be uh, pleased to hear that. But what we didn't know is that through the glass windows of the restaurant on the other side, there was bull riding happening in West Fargo, North Dakota. Did any of you go watch the bull riding last night? Bull riding fans? Not a single one of us. I think we all need to check the country music channel on the way home to get inspired. But I was, no, don't do that. Um, but here we are, like this, this dressed-up couple, and through the glass, 
we see what appears to be like a Keith Urban type concert environment out there. I've never seen Keith Urban in, in person, but it's just like, they're like sacrificing a cow out there out of like the, the famous Dave's level tent, and, and they're like, everyone's got a cowboy hat on, and they're like blaring every stereotypical country music song, and there are real bulls, like no mechanical bulls, these are authentic bulls coming out, and people are talking like this, and, and we are, we're feeling out of place, but then we thought, what if we went to the bull riding? instead of this dinner, and then we thought, no, people would probably like cast us out, like, if you don't have a cowboy hat, leave, in Jesus' name, you know, they'd probably tell us to just leave, like, do that to us, probably not like that, but they would probably push us away. Um, but we were like, so we felt like we were in an aquarium, like we're on the side of the aquarium, and then like the country music festival was on the side, and we were like, wow, this is, this is awkward, but the food was really good, and we, were, and we got to just like talk, and we had five people to wait on us, we felt like royalty, it was amazing. You never know what to expect. And with the Holy Spirit, you also get power that you didn't expect, and Ryan is gonna help me out by throwing me something. You, you knew there'd be a prop, you knew there would, oh wow, look at that, it's bagged, because it would be dangerous if you threw it to me unbagged. So in your life, and in my life, I was like, is that covered in tuberculosis, Dave? <laughs> um, <okay. laughs> Everyone give Cordell a hand. Everyone give Cordell a hand. I just want to say, you guys, in, in, if you love Jesus, and if you don't love Jesus in this place, um, that is okay. You are always welcome. Um, we hope that the power of Jesus Christ would impact your life. Um, you might want to say to your friend, I took a picture of my pastor holding power cables or jumper cables in church, in which case, here you go. That's your, that's your opportunity. <laughs> Should I look more confident? Okay. <clears throat> so you're like, this guy's crazy. But you're listening. Have you noticed that you're listening to this? Okay. Um, did you know that when you... When you are a follower of Christ, in this whole world, um, we have the opportunity today to sell, you might not know this, for people who love Jesus all over the world, we celebrate this day as a unique day. It's, it's the day that we celebrate Pentecost, which is when God poured out his spirit on people for the first time. And why is that significant? It's because you and I don't have the power on our own to live for Jesus. We don't have the power on our own to share about who Jesus is with somebody else. We don't have the power to minister to somebody on our own, actually. You might say, Dave, what does it mean to minister to somebody? I'm going to talk about it for a couple minutes, but really all we are, friends, are jumper cables. You have power that the, that the Spirit does in your life, but this is all that happens, really. You're nothing more, really, than jumper cables if you follow Jesus, and neither am I. But we hook up to the Lord, because we know he's the one with the power. And we say, all right, give me your hands. No. <laughs> Get on over here, whippersnapper. Uh, but, but what we do is we say, God, I have no power on my own. I can't do anything for anybody. But I believe that you can use me, and for you, maybe it might be a word of encouragement that really impacted you. It might be a prayer that someone prayed over you. It might be someone who shared their story with you and it impacted you because it was a testimony of what Jesus can do in somebody's life. It might have been a message at church. It might have been a small group session with a, a small group who led you through some Bible verses and helped us apply some scripture, you know, scriptural truth. But essentially, we, we just connect and we just say, okay, God, do what only you can do and I'm willing to be the one you work through. Because friends, the goal in this life is not that people would depend on us or lean on us, but that after a message, a small group, a prayer time, a time of encouragement, that people would depend more on Jesus than ourselves. I wanna always point people towards Jesus. He's the source. Sometimes I've been on the receiving end of this. How many of you, you've been on the receiving end of that? Raise your hand, raise your hand right now. Raise, raise, raise it high. I have been on the other side. Somebody was used by the Holy Spirit to be a blessing and to minister to my life. What a beautiful thing. We celebrate that today, the day of Pentecost. And you might say, day of Pentecost, whoa, I don't know what to think when I think about the day of Pentecost. So many things might come to mind. Pentecost means 50th. That's what that word means, 50th. Because Pentecost, starting over 1,000 years ago, 
Well, actually, over a thousand years before Jesus would even walk the earth. Actually, can I hand these back to you, Cordell? I won't throw them at you. Um, over a thousand years before Jesus would walk the earth, Pentecost was celebrated 50 days after a feast was celebrated that was called Passover. And as I was praying about this message, I just got to be honest with you. I was going to tell you all about Pentecost right from the get-go, right from the jump, no pun intended with the jumper cables, but I was going to tell you all about Pentecost. And then God just checked my heart and said, Dave, you cannot talk about Pentecost until you talk about Passover. So I'm going to, you know, a couple minutes, tell you about the Passover. And I'm going to level, I know these people got to listen to me over here, so I'm going to, I'm going to tell this side of the room something about Passover. Now listen up, everybody. In first service, there was a young lady that, like, she was, like, five years old. She followed me back and forth. It was pretty cool. I, I miss, wherever you are, I miss you. Passover did not get, like, thought up by God's people. God's people, because of their own decisions, had found themselves in slavery and in bondage. It was so bad, and it went on for so long, that God met with a man named Moses in a bush that was burning but would not be consumed and told Moses this, I have seen the misery of my people and I'm concerned about them. And I want you to know today, if you are in church and you don't hear anything else today, I want you to hear that God sees your misery and he is concerned about you too, in a loving way. Because he wants you to be free from the things or people that are binding your life in a way that you weren't created to be bound. And so he tells Moses, Moses, you're going to go to Pharaoh, who's the leader of the people that are holding my people bond in bondage, and you're going to tell him to let them go. And Moses is like, I can't, I can't, I can't. I'm paraphrasing. This would be like the message version. I can't, Lord, I'm a wuss. And then God's like, no, speak. Speak my words. I've got you, Moses. Moses is like, I can't, I can't. He's like, fine, I'll bring Aaron along and he'll help you. Because I love my people so much, I'll use you as an imperfect person, and I'll use Aaron as an imperfect person to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And so Pharaoh's like, not letting them go. Nope, make me. So then God's like, Moses, I'm going to send plagues on the people that are holding my people captive until Pharaoh lets my people go. And there were things like locusts came and destroyed all of their crops. The river that they took water and cleansed themselves from turned into blood and was unusable. There were boils that broke out on the captor's skin. And even after all of that judgment, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not let God's people go. The ninth plague, no, there were ten. The ninth plague that was sent was three days of complete darkness. It says in Scripture in Exodus 11 that the darkness was so thick it could be felt. God was trying to communicate, let my people go. I care about them. So Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go, God says. And Pharaoh said, you can go, but you cannot take anything with you. And Moses said, we must worship our God when we leave this place. So we need livestock to sacrifice. He said, you can't have it. Pharaoh said, I'm not letting your people go. This is Exodus 11. And we should all read Exodus 1 through 12. Pharaoh says this to Moses. Never come before me again. If you come before me again, you will surely die. And this is what Moses says to him. It shall be as you say, I will never stand before you again. And the reason why I'm getting emotional is because God was about to do something that would allow something to happen so significant that Moses would never have to talk to Pharaoh again. Because what Moses, it's getting heavy over here, isn't it? I'm going to level this out for everybody, okay? So, so Moses goes back to the people and he says, listen up, everybody. What God's going to do is going to be so significant and so powerful that not only will Pharaoh let us go, but he will drive us out and tell us to leave. And so that night, Moses said, there will be judgment that passes over every home of the captors of our people, and the firstborn of every person and every livestock will die. But this is what's so cool. Not, not a single firstborn of your families or your livestock will die because we're going to do something. This is what God asks us to do. Take a lamb that is completely spotless without defect 
And I want you to slaughter that lamb. Some of you are like, whoa, this is getting crazy. But this is how, this is how crazy God is about wanting you to be free. I just want that to be clear. Because God is getting people's attention. You're going to take a spotless lamb. You're going to slaughter it. You're going to pour the blood into the basin, which is like the hole that people dug at the entrance of their homes. So that when water came, it wouldn't flood the whole house. Spotless lamb, slaughter it, put the blood in the basin. I want you to take a branch of hyssop, which is like a branch with leaves on it. I want you to dip it in, and I want you to take the blood of a spotless lamb, and I want you to paint it, this is what it says, on the top of the doorframe and on the sides of the doorframe. And this is what's going to happen in the middle of the night. When God sends judgment, every time, he, every time the judgment comes to a home, and there is blood on the top of the doorpost and on the sides and in the basin, judgment will pass over your home. Little did these people know, 1,432 years before Jesus would ever walk the earth, that they would paint the blood of a spotless lamb where Jesus bled on his head a crown of thorns, on the side where Jesus bled with the nails in his hands and leave the rest of the blood in the basin where his feet were fastened by a nail. 1,432 years before, the Israelites were prophesying about a spotless lamb of God, a savior who would come and not take away sin for a moment and not cause death to pass over them for one day, but to pass over their life. And so every year, not one time, every year, the people of God would celebrate. Well, Cody, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> Cody's our guitar player. You're going to have to reset that. <laughs> every year, the people of God would celebrate the Passover feast, where in the middle of the night, we escaped from Egypt, and the people said, get out or we'll all die. That is exactly what the people said that were holding them captive. Get out or we'll all die. And they escaped that night. And even Moses said, when your kids ask you, what does the Passover mean to you, you are to tell them it was the night we left Egypt in the middle of the night because judgment had passed over our homes. Now, what's so cool is 50 days, I'm so sorry, Cody, can we just pray for Cody's pedals right now? <laughs> 50 days after the Passover every year, there was another feast celebrated, and that was the Feast of Pentecost. 50 days after the Passover, Pentecost commemorated the start of the wheat harvest. And this is what would happen. People would start the harvest, the farmer would go and collect the first sheaf of wheat, give it to the pastor or the priest, and the priest would wave it before the Lord, and they would declare, God, we took in the first sheaf of grain on our own power. But we cannot take in the rest of this harvest without your help. And they did this year after year after year after year. I want to pause for a moment and share the significance of the Passover and the Pentecost. Jesus died on the night of the Passover to confirm that he was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 26. After Jesus had got done saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Jesus died on the night of the Passover and fulfilled the prophetic nature of the feast of the Passover so that People would know forever, Jesus died as the sinless, spotless Lamb of God so that judgment would pass over your life. The Spirit of God was poured out on the Feast of Pentecost because in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And these believers had been waiting for the Spirit of God to be poured out and friends, God is not trying to be confusing to you. He's not trying to be cryptic to you. He's trying to be so clear, like, I know it's been religious at times. Like, can you imagine all the people celebrating Pentecost? Like, all right, Ted, bring the first sheaf of grain. 
God, we can't take in the rest without you. All right, carry along, you know. And I'm sure over some years it was like, man, God, we need you. But how many of you, you know, raise your hand, you know a farmer. You know someone who farms land. I don't know how farmers do it without God in their lives. There's so many things that work against farmers. You can't control the weather. You can't control the, I mean, you can kind of control insects and other pestilence. But it's hard, right? And then, like, is it, like, genetically modified? You know, what about hail? You know, what about... Help me out. What, what else bad happens? The prices, you know, or whatever. All oh, the prices are high right now. But you know what I'm saying? Like, there's a lot of things that farmers deal with, right? And so in their minds, they're like, we totally get this. Like, we wave the first sheaf before you, but we're not going to be able to do this on our own power. God, we need your power. But what I love about Acts chapter 2, and we're going to talk about that more next week, before Acts chapter 2 calls at, uh, comes Acts chapter 1. And in Acts chapter 1, we see the final words of Jesus. And I used to work in an intensive care unit, so I, I got to see people leave and go into eternity um, more than I would have enjoyed. But what I can tell you is that not a single person that I've ever met who entered eternity has ever wanted to mince their words towards the end. They wanted to be exceedingly clear about what was important to them and what they wanted people to know. But in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 3, it says, after his suffering, that's Jesus, he's, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And I love how the Bible is just real and raw about people's confusion. Because as followers of Christ, we get confused sometimes. These believers were confused because they're like, Jesus, this is so great. You're going to come back. You're going to overthrow the government. We're going to be your cabinet members. I want to be there. I want to be there. You know, you don't, no elections. Like, just, you're in my crew. You're going to lead with me. And Jesus wasn't talking about overthrowing the Roman government. He wasn't talking about them getting a position at the proverbial table of leadership. Verse 7, he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father is set by his own authority, but you will receive, say it a little bit louder, power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And now for you and me, this would be and you will be my witnesses in Fargo-Moorhead and in Cass and Clay County and in North Dakota and Minnesota and South Dakota and Canada and to the ends of the earth, which is the same for them and for us, same. Ends of the earth, pff, universal truth, man. Ends of, the earth, ends of the earth, also known as Alaska, but never mind. Ends of the earth. But what he's saying is you're going to have power and you're going to be able to share what I've done in your life to someone else, and that person is gonna share with someone else, and it's gonna, this thing is gonna domino, it's gonna spread, but it's not going to happen without the power that I pour out on you. Verse nine, after this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. It's like, I could, this is me trying to like, go up into heaven, right? So it's like, hey, don't, this is not a suggestion, a command, don't leave Jerusalem, wait, and he's gone. They're like, Oh, man, Apple weather did not tell us there was going to be a cloud. And then here's this cloud hiding Jesus from their sight, right? And so they all have to, like, live with this. Oh, he said, don't leave Jerusalem. Wait for my father promised. John baptized with water. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so they begin to wait. A few truths I want us to pull out of this. The first one is that the day Jesus died and the day the Holy Spirit was poured out on people at Pentecost were planned. It was all part of God's plan. It was intentional. It was clear. It was to fulfill a prophetic celebration that occurred every year. And it was a message to you and me forever that God wanted there to be no question that what was fulfilled on that day was not just for people who'd follow God before, but everyone who would ever follow Jesus for the rest of time. So here, here's my question for you. If God was this intentional about when he would die as the son of God and about when he would pour his spirit out on people, what makes you think that he doesn't have a good and perfect plan for your life 
or a plan for your situation or a way that he wants to take something in your life and make it part of his story that would reverberate through your eternity and in the eternities of other people. It was planned then, and I want to let you know that your life has a plan, and I wonder if maybe today is part of God's plan for your story. The second truth is that there was expectation. We live in expectation. We are people who come expecting. Sometimes I think we come to church, especially if we've known Jesus a long time, or we come to a group and we're like, let's just exist today. Raise your hand, you're like, you go into existence mode? I'm here to exist. The weather's really nice outside, so I just want to wrap it up, Dave. <clears throat> wrap it up. I got Frisbee golf in the park next. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes this is the prayer I need to pray. God, make me hungry again. Like, maybe I got to fast sometime this week. Just say, God, I want to be hungry spiritually again, so I want to be hungry physically to remind myself of this. But it says that they were all together in one place. But before they were all together in one place, he said, you will receive power. So they were waiting to receive power. They were expecting that God would pour his spirit out and give them power. My question for us is, what if you and I came to church, small group, we prayed a prayer with somebody as the jumper cables, and we expected that God was gonna do something, that the spirit of God was gonna flow through us and minister to somebody in our lives, through a prayer, through a word of encouragement, through a conversation. But I'm here to tell you that we are, at Northview Church, we are not a people that slip into like, been there, seen that, if only it was like how it used to be, other people need this, I don't need this. You, friends, the, Peter in the Bible, in the book of Acts, it says that as he would walk by people that were in his shadow, that they would receive healing from physical disease. And I just want to let you know that until you and I are walking around and our shadows are healing people miraculously through the power of the Holy Spirit, I would propose to you that you and I can hunger for more of the Spirit of God in our lives. Like, my shadow may never heal a single person, but there's more for me. There's more in, in Dave Liedahl's life where the Spirit of God could be operating. And here's the third really, 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 really important thing. And it's that the, the power from the Holy Spirit that was poured out had a purpose. It wasn't, it wasn't like the, the, the ultimate self-help guide of the universe. Thank you, you know. No, the power to be a witness. Like, this, this goes beyond, like, a spiritual Facebook post. Like, this goes beyond, like, an Instagram story that has a Bible verse. And I love those, by the way. If you're like, oh, Dave's seen how many Bible verses I post on Instagram. This is not like conviction on you. It's just, I'm saying this. You know where I need power? When I'm sitting next to somebody on an airplane and the Holy Spirit's like, you gotta talk to them about your story. And I'm like, nah. We got, but we both have peanuts, we're fine. And they're, wa they're watching a movie without headphones in, so nobody wants to talk to them anyway. And no, in all seriousness. Or, or like, what about that family member that you've prayed for for years, but you just, you worry so much about ruining relationship, like you don't want to go into anything spiritual. You need the Holy Spirit. I would propose to you and, and that you may be in this place and you've been like turned off by church or turned off by spirituality or turned off by Jesus or turned off by faith because there was an imperfect person that shared Jesus with you. And they had their own stuff that they were dealing with in their life and they like maybe smelled or maybe they were not attractive. And I think some of us in first service were leaning over and talking to each other because if you think about who shared Jesus with you, that person maybe wasn't perfect. And that's the beautiful thing about Pentecost. God was gonna pour his spirit out on people knowing that they're imperfect, they messed up in their own lives, they didn't have everything figured out, they weren't attractive, they weren't persuasive, but God was gonna use them to share a good thing about Jesus with somebody else. And just like Passover was judgment, passing over people's homes and with Jesus passing over people's lives, God's like, if you want to take a good crop that's out there and bring it into yourself for something good, there might be someone out outside the kingdom of God that's going to be able to be brought into the family of God, into the kingdom of God through your insignificant, sometimes messed up life. Did you know if you receive prayer from me, if you've received prayer from a pastor or a smuggler, there might be a person that's ministered to you that's not even walking for God today. 
You say, well, was my experience invalid? No, because the Spirit of God operates through jumper cables known as people, imperfect people that are empowered by the Spirit of God to be a witness, to share. So this might be your day where you say, I am okay receiving Jesus because of the encouragement of an imperfect person. Like, don't let my, don't let my weakness, don't let my lack of expertise or a, div- or a divinity degree keep you from experiencing something powerful in Jesus today. I realize it's not me. The people who've ministered into your life realize it's not them. That one kind of creepy person in your family who loves Jesus and they annoy you, but you know that there's something about what they're saying, guess what? The Spirit of God's just trying to get into your life, hoping that you respond to Jesus, not to that person, but to Jesus. Can we stand in this place? The Spirit of God poured out so that we can come to a knowledge of Jesus even if it's from the messages of imperfect people, and that you and I would be empowered to share with someone else even though we're imperfect. But can we bow our heads, close our eyes, and just, I wonder if there's someone here who'd say, oh man, Passover, oofta. That that hit deep because I don't know if I've applied the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, like the reason why he came, to my own life. But I need to know that I've been forgiven, that I've been set free. I'm not an Israelite in Egypt, but I am a person who lives in this community or somewhere nearby that just needs Jesus. And and I'm willing to apply the sacrifice of Jesus to my life. Maybe you're here and you need to make that decision today. I'm not gonna embarrass you, but I am gonna ask you to put your hand over your heart right now as an outward sign of something you wanna have happen on the inside of you. I want you to pray in your heart as I pray out loud. Father, I thank you for Jesus. This was all part of your plan. Today is part of your plan and for my life. And I pray, Father, that even though I'm a sinner and I know I've done things wrong, I thank you that you are the forgiver and that you are the one that sets me free from the bondage of sin in my own life so that judgment passes over my life. And I believe that Jesus was sent as a son of God. I believe that he lived a sinless life. I believe that he died and was raised to life for me. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart today that God raised him from the dead so that I can be saved. And I thank you for a new life, God. Here's my life. Help me to live wholeheartedly for you all of my days and not just Pentecost Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. Over these next few moments, can I just invite us to open up our hands to the Lord as if to receive? What if we just got hungry for Jesus again? What if we just got hungry for his Holy Spirit to do something in our lives, to be poured out into our lives in a new way? And as we prepare for our next week, the finale of the Discover the Spirit collection, as we gear up for next week, as we talk about the last message and also about the Holy Spirit night that we're gonna have next Sunday night, can we just be expecting that God's gonna do something in our own hearts this week? Father, we ask that over these next few moments that your spirit would be poured out on us. We open ourselves to you as to receive and ask that you would do in our lives what only you can in Jesus' name.